Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Michelle Miao, host of the Michelle Miao Show and also a member of the Board of Governors for the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm pleased to have our two guests with us for this program. They'll talk about how political campaigns can fall trapped to racist strategies and oftentimes will create division among our communities. What's behind these harmful strategies? Let's hear from our guests today. Hi, everyone. My name is Steve Lee. Uh, I uh, am a uh, juvenile school counselor, um, started out as an activist and got involved in politics. Uh, and then that's when I started public service, uh, ran for school board, served as a school board member, a council member, and was uh, mayor of the city of Up Grove and was reelected for a second term. Uh, and um, that's who I am. Okay, hi, I'm Kua Loli. I am married to Steve, of course, and he and I have been married for 28 years. We've been together for 29 years. Uh, we have two boys, and I guess professionally, I am a teacher. Um, I taught English for eight years, and then I transitioned to becoming a teacher librarian. So now I work at the middle school in Elko Unified School District. This is my 23rd year in the district. And so I love what I do. Uh, besides being a teacher, you know, wife, I'm also a mother. And I think this is um, the main reason why I want to speak out, especially on these subjects, because so many things are happening. And um, it's, you know, a bit of a frightening time that we're living in right now. And so um, speaking out is important to ensure the safety of our children, especially those. Um, in our margin, marginalized communities. Well, let's get to know you a little bit more. Many people know you in the community for what you do, your profession, but let's get to know you a little bit more personally. How did you two meet? Um, you know, I mean, it's uh, in the, uh, the, the Hmong community as well as the, the, the Lao or even the Southeast Asian community, our, our communities are so... Um, separated, you know, um, either geographically um, or, um, you know, uh, either time zone or, 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 or what have you, right? And so what, um, <clears throat> what uh, we've discovered in college is that um, there's a whole community online, and this is at the birth of the internet. Um, back when we didn't have the World Wide Web, uh, it was strictly text uh, driven and um, uh, I discovered that I can actually meet a number of Hmong uh, college uh, students uh, across the nation uh, online and um, that's how I met her. But what I do tell people is that um, I put out an ad online and she responded. So <laughs> that, that's the uh, over the top um, exaggerated, exaggerated um, version. You know, version. But the truth of the matter is that, um, you know, I, I met her online and um, that was um, early 90s. Yeah. So, so is that true? Cool. Okay. So here, yeah, here's a real story. <laughs> Uh, so we um, had mutual friends in college. We're all, you know, going to college. I'm actually from Minnesota, um, the Twin Cities, St. Paul specifically. And so I was at college and Steve was here at UC Davis. And so we had mutual friends and then they changed, I guess they exchanged address, email address, um, just like phone numbers. And so I guess he contacted me and I'm like, no, not another guy because, you know, <laughs> I had to fight really hard, right, to be trusted, to go away to college. I need to finish college. I need to do all this stuff. The last thing I want to do is prove the fears of my mom, who's a single parent, right, right? Like fall in love with a guy and get married and have the fear of not fin finishing college. So I ended up doing exactly what she did not want me to do. <laughs> but I did prove her wrong because I did finish college. And we didn't start a family until we had our job. We graduated from college. I became a teacher. He became a juvenile hall counselor. Um, so in that sense, we waited eight years until we started a family. So yeah. Well, how or why did Elk Grove become home? It become a place where you wanted to raise your family and where you wanted to plant your roots and 
yeah, maintain your careers? The biggest thing for us is we actually grew to love Davis. Um, went to school there, love the city, <clears throat> love the uh, college lifestyle, uh, and wanted to stay in Davis for as long as we can. Uh, and um, uh, when, when we both finished, she went to graduate school at Davis. And um, I figured, okay, we could still live in family housing. So let's see how long we can actually live here. So we lived in family housing while she was attending teaching school and I was working full time. By then, I had already uh, started working for the, uh, the county schools and um, uh, started working with the at-risk population, student population in Sacramento County. And so um, uh, she graduated and um, our intent was to find a place where we can settle down, um, but we couldn't um, you know, determine um, where that would be. And so we temporarily um, picked um, a, a residence that was close to my workplace. But every, every day I would, I would have to send her um, about uh, 20 miles away to Elk Grove and then drive 20 miles back. Because we only had one car. Yeah, <laughs> to, to start work um, at um, eight o'clock in the morning. And it just got to the point where I, um, once she landed her full-time job, uh, it made sense to move to Elk Grove. But before we even mm -hmm. considered Elk Grove, um, we would you know, commute back and forth to Fresno where, where I grew up, uh, uh, Clovis, Fresno. And um, <clears throat> we stopped off um, for gas or, or I think it was gas or food or something like that. And we drove out on um, Elk Grove Boulevard. Um, got a little bit turned around and um, got to see the city a little bit and uh, realized that uh, this is the kind of city that uh, resembles my old, old my old hometown, which is Clovis, and um, uh, wanted to eventually um, come to Elk Grove. It just so happened that um, Kwa's internship and um, her um, her placement wound up in Elk Grove, and ultimately. Um, it wasn't the first job, I don't think, right? It was uh, it's one of the uh, earlier jobs that were offered um, here in Elk Grove to, to bring her on as a full-time teacher. And um, that's how we wanted her up in Elk Grove, yeah. And stayed. Stayed a long yeah. time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Elk Grove is pretty diverse, at least when it comes to the Asian community. The last data that I read was back in 2018 and reports had shared that over 20% of its residents identify as Asian American. Share any experiences you've had with anti-Asian racism or bias. No, I think for, for the longest time, I, I have always been a firm believer in diversity. And I, uh, part of our decision in uh, settling down in Elk Grove is because of its diversity and, and um, what appears to be uh, inclusive. Um, now, I would uh, honestly say that the majority of Elk Grovians um, are very inclusive. Um, we have, um, you know, neighbors, we have colleagues down here um, that are very welcome. Uh, but like everything else, there's always only a few uh, that ruins it for the rest of everyone. Uh, and um, it, um, at the beginning, it, it wasn't as pronounced, uh, but what I have discovered in the process of, of serving uh, as an elected now here is, um, you know, people just blatantly telling me, hey, look, uh, go back to where you came from, you know, and um, it, at first I thought it was, okay, well, there's only one person, but it's consistently with a certain type of people who would come and troll my social media and then make these kind of comments. And you know, I figured these are maybe troll accounts. No, these are actual real people. These are real people that are proud um, to tell me that I need to go back to where I came from. Uh, and um, that's the, the, the part that, you know, honestly kind of caught me off guard. I, I have gone through that whole period of coming to the United States and being picked on, you know, because I couldn't speak English properly. Um, I didn't look like the Clovis kids. Uh, and throughout my years, I've always been bullied by those who felt that I was an easy target. And I had thought those days were over. You know, I had thought that I'd moved beyond that. And here I am 
uh, as an elected in the city of Elk Grove, one of the most diverse cities in America, you know, uh, the fifth largest school district with, uh, I want to say 80 plus uh, languages that are being spoken here in uh, the school district uh, and 60 plus in the city of Elk Grove. Um, but yet, <clears throat> you know, I am subject subjected to, um, you know, these kind of comments. Uh, and it's, uh, it's kind of left me speechless, you know, um, really hurt, to be honest with you, because I had thought that um, people are better than this, you know, I have thought that we as a nation has gone beyond and, and gotten to the point where uh, we recognize and understand that everyone in America comes from somewhere. And that being the, the, the case, we are inclusive and, and welcoming. Uh, and, um, you know, when that happened, it caused me to, to pause and really reflect and try to understand what I'm witnessing. Yeah. And, well, I also wanted to add that um, Elk Grove predominantly is very inclusive and very accepting. We moved here in 1998. And when Steve first ran for office in 2002, um, he, of course, was unsuccessful. And then um, he went, as they say in the Chinese movies, went and trained in the mountains and came back in 2012. And when he ran by then, the, the, the ethnic landscape of Elk Grove had changed drastically. Um, when we moved here in 1998, it was only 70,000. We're almost close to 200,000 here in Elk Grove. And so in 1990, uh, 2012, when he ran for school board, the second time he won overwhelmingly. Um, and then when he ran for city council, when he ran for mayor the first time, I mean, these weren't appointed positions where he was given the position. He was chosen and selected by the constituents of Elk Grove. I mean, for an, uh, an Asian person to do that in a community, in a city that's very reflective of mainstream America, that was just astounding. And we just couldn't believe it. It was incredible. And then came 2018 when he was running again, just, um, you know, again, he was reelected. And then to 2020 and 2020, we were just numb at the hate that we received. It was just so traumatic. Like I was just appalled. And a part of me says, you know, I think it's because the people of Elk Grove are really good. And when they hear that something is bad, even though they, you know, probably didn't do the research and find that when people campaign, they paint really negatively. And they will put all sorts of stuff out there to perpetuate hate. And these people, these few, I don't, I still believe they don't represent the majority of Elk Groveans. They will come and just say hateful things like, oh, you know, China man, why don't you go back to where you came from? Um, go home refugee as we are children, we are refugees. Um, and just hateful, just awful, hateful, hurtful things. And, you know, everybody knows nationally, right? Given the political landscape, of 2020 and locally that it bled locally, which is again, alarming. And that those kind of people felt that it was safe to come out mm -hmm. and um, perpetuate and spread hate. And like I said, in one of our press conference, who, the people that were running at the time made it okay, made Elk Grove a place for hate. And we've always thrived and um, we're prideful of the fact that Elk Grove is not a place for hate. And in 2020, we were proven wrong. And again, it was just numbing and shocking to the point where we didn't even know how to react. Like, wow, this is Elk Grove. This is a city that we love mm -hmm. so much. And that's why we are in service because we just want to do what's good and encourage people that the only way we can go forward with anything is to build those coalitions to build allies with like-minded folks. And of course, as a mother, just building that future for our children. And so in 2020, um, never before, I personally have never faced it in Elk Grove, but in 2020, it was just, um, just, yeah, shocking, appallingly shocking for me. Like I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And even to the point where I'm talking about today, now realize that I'm traumatized by it, when you know all I do is the tears will just want to come out and it's just yeah even it's been two years it's still very hurtful and just shocking to me. Kua I want to acknowledge how traumatic and painful these experiences were 
And I think you share what a lot of Americans are feeling and what they're going through right now. And during these times, it's so important that we unite, right? That we come together and support another in a very healthy way uh, to just to care. And so I hope that, you know, your support system is showing up for you because you do so much for your community. Now, Steve, the opponent um, who ran against you as you ran for your second term for mayor of Elk Grove is also a member of the Asian American community. Let's talk about what happened there and especially about how racism can affect our entire community. And we're not a monolith as Asian folks. You know, uh, there was a local reporter that said something that really um, resonated. And he said, success breeds alienation. I think, I, I don't know if those are Contempt. the exact content. Contempt. Yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, I honestly, I've been blessed, um, you know, getting elected uh, to the school board and being successful to getting to council and then council to mayor uh, within a very short period of time, um, you know, and, and in politics, um, to be able to, to, to ascend that quickly, you, it takes a whole career, a lifetime. Um, but I just been blessed uh, to, to conduct myself in such a way that it's at once very responsive to the people. It's very collaborative, uh, and um, with, uh, that being the case, we saw it in 18, 2018 um, with uh, uh, hate mailers, uh, with uh, the squinty eye mayor, um, you know, sent by the California Realtors Association uh, and um, uh, other PACs that, are, that sided with them. And subsequently, they kind of wrote on that. And I think what we saw in 2020 is when you run out of ideas uh, to challenge a person on policy issues, what you do is you attack them and you start making stuff up. Uh, and that's what we saw in 2020. And they saw an opportunity. And um, uh, you said something earlier in the opening um, about uh, even though they are Asian Americans, it doesn't mean that they can't perpetuate Asian hate. And the reason why that's important to note is, um, and we've seen it historically before, um, you know, back in, in, in the times of the Japanese internment, um, uh, we had other Asian uh, Americans who would literally post up signs to say, hey, I'm not Japanese, please don't pick on me. Um, you know, those are indicators of just minority groups not wanting to be singled out. Uh, you know, but in 2020, it's a little bit, um, you know, uh, different. And I think that a portion of it was driven politically, uh, but a portion of it was capitalizing on the fact that um, only the negativity within the Hmong community, particularly Hmong men, um, are being perpetuated by the mainstream media. And so as we saw that, um, the underlying issue uh, in 2020, which my opponents were hammering on, is that I am a Hmong man and I am a misogynist. Uh, and I think what's also noteworthy uh, during this time is that within this jurisdiction, there were um, two other Hmong men that were running for public office as well. So um, they, obviously the, the other side was a coalition and they wanted to perpetuate that, oh, oh Hmong men, uh, you must beat your wife, you must abuse uh, you know, uh, women and take advantage of women. And they just all harped on that and jumped on it. And, and it, it got to the point where um, my opponents were, were talking about me being the godfather, uh, you know, being the sinister Asian uh, uh, clansman um, that would call all the shots and would send people to harass uh, others. And that's so, so far from the truth, you know, and, and I always say this, look, professionally, I'm a juvenile school counselor that counsels students that have been uh, victimized by unimaginable things. Uh, you're telling me that now I'm a mafia king? Uh, and wait a minute, I've seen this before. What you're doing is you're writing all the coattails of stereotypes throughout the history uh, of America and uh, pegging me as that evil, um, you know, Asian uh, godfather uh, and uh, you hate women and you continue to perpetuate this. And so um, they use this, harped on it, and then... Uh, used it to perpetuate 
uh, politically uh, their agenda. Uh, and uh, that's what we saw in 2020. I did read some articles that attacked you, Steve. One article described you as a Klansman or used the Hmong clan system in a very negative way. Let's face it, even the word clan has a very negative connotation as its deep roots in our nation's trauma exists till this very day. Talk to us about how this affected you, your family, your whole culture, really, uh, and you know, even how it, it may affect the Hmong community when someone really doesn't understand your culture and then they use it in this way in which it's dangerous as it perpetuates the, the hate, the anti-Asian racism and hate. The thing that really bothers me most is how do I explain this to my boys who witness all this and ask me to explain to them how they are to process and to represent the Hmong community when other children are calling them Klansmen or other children are looking at them and saying that you're part of the mafia. That's how hurtful it was. It wasn't so much political. It was attacking the structure that built the Hmong community. It was attacking my two boys. It was attacking every man who calls himself a member of the Hmong community. The, the, the thing here is, you know, it's so irresponsible of politicians who claim that they want to lead uh, to, to say that and at the same time uh, use an opportunity uh, to attack another minority group. Um, and that's the hardest part for me. That's the, heart, the part that breaks my heart. You know, and I wonder whether other people see this, you know, uh, and I say this, you know, a good measurement of this is if it wasn't the Hmong community, if you took any other group and you said the same thing about them, there's no ifs, ands, and buts, it's racism. But yet, like what we have seen across the nation, um, the, the ones who are attacked, the ones who uh, are targeted are the ones who are marginalized. And uh, being the Asian American groups, um, you know, across the United States, um, there's a tendency for them to not fight back. Uh, and um, I think that the actions in 2020 really kind of fed into that and kind of rode on the coattails of, of, oh yeah, they're not gonna fight back. Um, they're gonna be complacent. They're just gonna sweep this under the rug. But what is really hurtful is how do I explain this to children who will look to the Hmong community and automatically think, oh, you must be some sort of a mafia uh, member. Uh, and, and nobody ever asked us, nobody ever consulted to, to try to determine what the clan system really is made up of. You know, I mean, never mind the fact that the Hmong clan system is composed of 18 family um, uh, clan that uh, for the sake of um, uh, formation, um, it, it was designed so that cultural um, burial rites, uh, cultural weddings uh, could be uh, uh, probably C2. Uh, and so I don't know if you, you are aware, Michelle, but it's me being a, a Lee, I am prohibited from marrying a Lee. That's why I married a Lo. So uh, for my boys who are Lees, they are prohibited from marrying the Lees because out of respect for the family name, um, you, the assumption is that all the Lees are related. Uh, and so that's what it really is. It's, it's, a, it's a kinship, um, you know, group. And um, the way it was labeled and the, the way it was used in public meetings, referring to my community as Klansmen, automatically gave you the image of, uh, you know, of Hmong men in white hoods. Uh, and, and that's the part that really, really hurts me. You know, it hurts my family, it hurts the Hmong community, and it hurts for any, it hurts anyone who 
uh, could potentially be mistaken as, as, as a mom. Um, and, um, you know, the, the sad part of is that this is continually perpetuated uh, in Elk Grove. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it, it's just, it is just overwhelming, you know, even till today uh, to try to comprehend why so-called leaders would stoop this low to attack minority group. Yeah, it's very, very unfortunate that people, you know, don't do their research. And in your case, really didn't do their research to understand the Hmong lineage system. And this is an example of politicizing an entire race for the benefit of a campaign or for political reasons. This isn't the first ugly campaign we're discussing today. And this is one of many in the American uh, political system. Our hope is that we can create a more fair political process or election process. And I think, you know, that's the heart of the discussions happening today. What are your ideas for some solutions so that folks who want to lead in politics one day don't use racism as a tool for political gains? I think for starters, one of the things, especially what we're facing right now, is what they call independent expenditures or dark money, right? Um, with the supervisor raise, there's a cap on funding and donations, but with these PACs or uh, political interest PACs, they have unlimited funding. And right now, there was just an article that came out today by a local uh, newspaper here in Elk Grove calling out the California Association of Realtors because right now they're attacking uh, an Asian woman who is also running for, for office here in Elk Grove. And then they're still attacking Steve. Mm -hmm. And and so it's like, okay, first time, okay, maybe it was just Steve, but now it seems like, and I believe they also attacked in 2020, another Asian woman running in Sacramento City too. This is California Association of Realtors. And so now we're like, wait a minute. Okay, we're not that dense. We're seeing where it is. It's yeah. race baiting. Yeah, and freeze the pattern, right? You yeah. are, you are um, depending marketing on the fears of mainstream, perhaps, you know, um, culture afraid of the foreigner or the other coming over, uh, taking over your, your community and doing all these things. And so for starters, get rid of you know, that kind of funding, let there be a cap um, because whoever has money has <clears throat> unlimited funding will get to deliver or put out whatever message that they wanna do. And right now they are perpetuating that Asian hate. I, I will say, and I'll be honest, and it's true. Um, and it's almost like, even though you know this is, 2022, you would think that people wouldn't do that, but they are, you know, still doing this and riding on this, this hate of Asians or other still, you, you would think that we made progress, but we haven't. It seems like the landscape is, is okay now um, for those who hate to come out and say whatever it is um, they want to say based on their own ignorance of different cultures. Our culture, the Hmong culture, our issues are not unique to us. It's every culture has these issues. And if one person does it, you know, even though Asians, right, we are it's whole before the individual. But as we were at that that age, I call it the sweet lucky spot. We're almost 50, but we get to live in both worlds, mainstream in our own home culture. And I think it's great. Some people think it's not, but I think it's wonderful because as educators, it's a teaching moment. And when we hear Hmong men do this, I would say, no, that's not true. We have healthy relationships, long lasting relationships. We love each other. We, we rear our children just like everyone else. We want them to be good people at the end of the day. That's all that matters. And so that's one way, I think, again, going back to the um, personal interest groups when it comes to political campaign, they have unlimited funding. Individual candidates do not have that. Like we are totally grassroots. Our funding is funded by small business owners, individuals. We don't have special interest money at all. So yeah, that's one, one way. You know, the other thing <clears throat> I think that people should have no fear to call out hate. You know, it's not, it's, it is hate whether the perpetrator, regardless of the color of the perpetrator, it is hate regardless of the organization. It is, hate is hate. And when you start setting Mellers attacking somebody, 
consistently attacking Asian Americans. Uh, and the three individuals, me included, well, if we include the, the other two individuals, there are significant Southeast Asians that are running uh, and for office in the Sacramento region. And when you look at that, and what's the rationale behind it? What's the reasoning behind it? Well, if you start sending mailers that uh, are highlighting the features that make them unique and ethically unique, um, and uh, you begin to see a pattern, yeah, that's called for what it is. And people should have no fear in doing that. Um, hate is not only uh, you know, applicable to certain groups of our community. Hate is hate. You know, um, and, and human beings can be the most loving, but human beings can also be the meanest uh, on this planet, right? Um, we've seen it historically. We've seen people being singled out because of the color of their hair, the color of their eyes, the ethnic group that they're a part of. Um, this is something that um, we as a community, as a whole, need to understand and make a stand. Um, you know, and um, I remember confronting the California Realtor Association and saying, you know, this Mellon is hateful. They stared at me in my eyes and said, no, it's not. You know, the person I was talking to is African-American. And I said, how do you feel? Is you being pulled over late at night, driving, you know, the car that you drive? I know he drives a luxury car. And I said, you know, you're being pulled over in law enforcement. And what's your first reaction? Well, they're only pulling me over because I'm Black. I said, no, what if I told you that based on the officer, his interpretation is that you fit a certain description and subjectively he doesn't think that he's profiling you. And so this uh, uh, member of the board said, no, because it's my perspective. And I told him that's exactly what my response is to you. It's my perspective. I see the features that you're highlighting. Uh, this picture of me has me laughing, but my eyes are squinted. And then in it, you sent a message hinting at me being the squinting eye mayor. Do we really want him as your mayor? I think that's unfair. I think that, you know, um, people should um, call it for what it is. When you see hate, it is hate, you know, and um, we have to have no fear to stand against those who continue to perpetuate this, even within our own Asian American community. If they are attacking another group for whatever reason, and we see it as hate, we have to call it for what it is. If you see something, say something. And that's something that, um, you know, uh, I've, I've heard all over, you know, um, you know different communities, um, but that's not the case. Only say something when it impacts certain people? No, um, the, the rule is real simple. If you see hate, call it for what it is and put a stop to it. That's the only way we can actually work together as a community and stop hate. Um, because as they say, today they came for me, uh, but tomorrow they will come for you. Uh, and um, you know, as a free thinking society like the United States, I think we have to have the courage um, to, to set an example of the rest of the world. Uh, but what I'm seeing in Elk Crow is that leaders in Elk Crow have actually felled each and every one of the residents that live here. Um, they have betrayed hate, and it is sad and disgusting. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Kwan. Uh, what you said also reminded me, something that we never saw before, that we saw in 2020, was a major news outlet in Sacramento that perpetuated this hate. Um, what happened, I remember this, uh, specifically March 2020, right at the height of COVID and our elderly Asian moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas were being targeted because of this leader nationally who said that COVID came from China, right? And so this mainstream uh, newspaper um, published the locations of where Asians lived in Sacramento County. And we were just like, of course, very nice. You know? I mean, <laughs> we, look. we were just like, okay, with all your resources and everything, you are a major news outlet and you are publishing this at the height of all this hate against Asians. And so Steve was the only elected who called them out on it. And the backlash was swift and immediate and they had to pull it and they had to 
published in a publication, uh, an apology. And that they had a personal vendetta. I feel they needed to the score with Steve. And so they perpetuated hate because they endorsed his opponent and just, you know, published up as a real news article as facts. Neither one of us ever, not me, when it came to Hmong men being misogynist, was ever asked my truth because I live it. I'm a Hmong woman. I'm married to a Hmong man. I'm raising Hmong boys, sons. No one, not this particular news outlet, came to me and asked me. An expert, I would say, in my own family community, not once did they come and ask me. And they just, articles after articles, just slamming Steve, hitting on Steve in such negative light. And, you know, they had the power that we did not have, which is print, print throughout Northern California. I think as far as what do we say? Yeah, it's the Sacramento Bee. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean let's, let's not kid. Look, uh, I stood up the Sacramento Bee. I called them out for, for them singling out the pockets of Asian Americans living in Sacramento County. Uh, and this is shortly after the President Trump was referring to the, the, the China flu. Is that what the term was? The, the China yes. flu? Yeah, the China flu. Kung and flu. Kung flu. There you go. Um, and and I, I took personal offense to that. Um, you know, I, I felt that as the president of the United States, he should know better uh, and he should not be perpetuating that, that kind of speech will perpetuate hate. And surely enough, what we see in Sacramento Bee is they publish this, uh, this the locations. Uh, geographic map uh, identifying the different location of Asian Americans. Uh, and, uh, you know, I saw through the BS and I just called them out on it, you know, and, you know, I felt that as, as a mayor of, of a diverse city like Elk Grove living in the Sacramento region, the capital of the state of California, uh, with a large Asian American population, um, I think it's important to, to, to hold them accountable. And I did, you know, and I think that that's what elected should do is, um, you have to have the courage to stand on your two feet. And when I did that, they had an extra grind. And so what we saw in the aftermath of that is repeated attacks on me and, and perpetuating uh, a, a coordinated agenda uh, to, to, to write as much negative things. And, and um, they highlighted and, and interviewed, uh, I remember specifically an article talking about you know, um, the, uh, so the patriarchy in the Hmong community, I think that's what they're referring to, the patriarchy, and not uh, spending any uh, ounce of time interviewing experts, uh, talking to, um, you know, anthropologists, uh, you know, social scientists, uh, but yet they talk to lay people, uh, people who has an opinion, and perhaps maybe people who grew up in a very troubled family and uh, who had been subjected to um, you know, mistreatment by uh, their fathers or the brothers, but that's their truth, not the truth of all Hmong Americans, not the truth of all Hmong women. And, um, you know, I, 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 I felt that was unfair as well. And um, I took the opportunity to, to, to stand up to that and, and uh, I returned a response and that didn't go well. Um, but, um, you know, I honestly, in retrospect, I, I'm proud that I did it uh, both times and I would do it again uh, because as um, Asian Americans um, who at least uh, have been here long enough, we uh, should, should have no fear to stand up and call hate for what it is when we see it. Uh, By so, whomever. Yeah, by whomever. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, you know, that was a dark time uh, for the Sacramento region. Uh, certainly, you know, it was very hurtful for my family as well. And then there's that problem too. And what I'm talking about is what every Asian American knows and it has been used since the beginning of time. And what I mean by that is since the very beginning when Asian people migrated to the United States and that is the perpetual foreigner concept, you know, and some key concepts I think many folks are becoming much more aware of these days is on top of the racism that exists in our communities. It's also the misinformation and disinformation and people's refusal to really do their homework to be educated on what's important. So despite you basically being an example of how racism fueled by misinformation can lead to harmful impacts of our community, what advice would you give to a young aspiring politician, especially of Asian descent? 
it's, it's inevitable that you will be attacked um, uh, based on your ethnicity. Uh, and, you know, Andrew Yang saw this uh, in his run for president. Um, and I think that Asian Americans see this. And oftentimes, um, there may be some Asian Americans that, that want to sweep it under the rug and not necessarily acknowledge it. But, um, it, you know, it, it does exist. You know, I mean, I've seen it so many times before. Um, I used to have a uh, Caucasian assistant and um, every event that we show up, they introduce, uh, hey, Mayor, uh, Mayor Lee is here and everyone looks to uh, my staff uh, thinking he's the mayor. It's difficult for people to accept that, you know, the short uh, stubby Asian guy happens to be the mayor of the city of Elk Grove, an all-American city. And, you know, I've seen this over and over again. And I think that for any one of us who um, looks different, um, who are part of a, a unique group, um, it's just a matter of time. Sooner or later, you will be yelled at, you will be attacked, you will uh, be accused of things that uh, you have nothing to do with. Uh, and so, um, you know, for any young person uh, who believes in uh, the spirit of what America is made of, uh, continue to pursue that, continue to, to go after it, uh, because that's what makes America special, is for the idealist to continue to pursue, regardless of the obstacles that uh, are stacked up against him or her. Um, and I think that that's something that we have to remind young people. Um, that um, when you when you see it and you want to make a change, you want to highlight um, uh, a policy, you want to shine the light, in the words of Michelle Obama, on issues uh, that you you want to help uh, perpetuate or or um, you know give rise to concerns uh, to the particular issue. Uh, you have to stand up. You have to stand up and run. You can't you can't let this defeat. Um, you know, yourself, you know, and as a young person, um, see that as a, this as an opportunity. Uh, and every time somebody tells you to go back to where you came from, use that, uh, use those words uh, as motivation. And, and um, you know, I mean, that being the case, that's, that's why I'm not stopping, you know, I mean, just because there are, you know, five to 10 individuals in the city of Elk Grove who continues to attack me uh, using racial slurs, that I'm not going to back down. You know, uh, I know who I am. I know what it took for my family to get here. Um, I know that in my story, um, you know, the story of my father rescuing American pilots in Laos is also the story of all Americans. And I always remind people of that each family here in the United States has a story. And when you peel the layers off and you look at what it took for that family to get here, that, in essence, is what America is all about. And for those who have forgotten and um, those who, who refuse to believe that America is made up of a country of immigrants, those are the ones who continue to perpetuate hate. Uh, it's because they're uneducated. It's because they're uncomfortable uh, about diversity, about inclusiveness, uh, about something that um, they're just not used to seeing. Uh, and... Um, you know, I, I, and, and I think that uh, for young people who want to continue on this journey of public service, I do encourage them to continue uh, and to pursue it. Don't let my uh, experience discourage you or don't even let the, the naysayers in your life discourage you. Push on. Steve, congratulations on making history as one of the first Hmong American mayors in the United States. I, I vote, I'm only the only one who made it uh, to the mayorship. Um, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, when I ran, I didn't, that wasn't the reason why yeah. I ran. I ran because I was tired of seeing, um, you know, things that were being neglected. You know, we had a, an abandoned mall in Elk Grove. Um, we had, um, you know, businesses that, that um, retail space that weren't being occupied. We had um, folks that used Elk Grove as, um, a, as a bed, and then they get up and then go and work somewhere else. And so these are real reasons why I, I ran. And the night that I, the night that I won in 16, um, I got a phone call from NBC and uh, they said, congratulations for being the first Hmong mayor in the United States. And I'm like, I took a moment and I'm like, I didn't realize that. 
like it's it's almost like a like a like a side effect of trying to do good right uh in the process of trying to uh improve my neighbor improve my city i just coincidentally uh, became the the first mayor of Hmong descent in Kua, what are your thoughts on how we can rebuild, especially as a mom raising two young boys during this very terrifying time? What are your thoughts on healing and building coalition? Well, definitely going back to, uh, you know, your question before, young people who want to follow this pathway of being a, a public servant is that if they do continue on with it, seek out people who've already paved the way. And what Steve always, and we talk about this all the time, being being on this journey together, and we, we have lots of conversations. And I always think of it as the evolution of a candidate, right? When you first start out, everybody loves you because you're like the yes person. Yeah, I'll do that. Sure, I'll do this. I'll do. But once you make a stand, mm -hmm. that's when people are like, no, I don't like you. Now we have to, you know, deal with you too. Just like during the pandemic when they wanted to, you know, um, not have the moratorium on renters, a rent renter moratorium. They wanted to evict people who were losing their homes, their jobs, not because of their own doing. And Steve, put, Steve said, no, we're not gonna do that. Our neighbors are gonna be homeless. You know, if we can do this, let's do this. Let's help them out a little bit. Or just a city as large as ours by district voting, right? He's like, what about if you had your mom, your neighbor that wants to run for city council? They should be able to. They should be able to have the funding to do so. So let's go by district, that sort of thing. But going to our own Asian American communities, representation matters. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear this repeatedly. Yeah. Representation matters. And so even though Steve may happen to be the first mayor of Hmong descent in the United States, what's even better is we had five more or 10 more, mm -hmm. 15, 20. Right, going back to what Michelle Obama said, when you walk through that door, right. you open it, you hold it open, and you pull others through. And that's been our lifelong dream. When people come to Steve and say, you know, you've been so helpful, what, what do you need from me? He's like, I don't want anything from you. The only thing I want from you is that if someone else, a young person comes to you and says, you know, I'm interested in doing what you're doing, I want you to give them the help, the same advice that I have given you. You know, give them your time, give them the knowledge, give them the ways that I've shown in, you know, and, and he's done it to countless individuals. In, uh, advice um, that would cost them thousands of dollars if they were to hire a professional consultant, but because he's been through it, um, he gives it willingly because again, going back to what, you know, former first lady Michelle Obama said, get through that door, hold it open, let others come through. And that's why we do what we do, not to be the first this, first that. No, because when it comes down to representation matters, because when I see someone that looks like me, mm -hmm. especially in the, nowadays, when we were growing up, we didn't have a lot of that, right? We kind of had to find our way, work our way through it. But our kids nowadays, it's important. Yeah, I can be like Jeremy Lin. He plays mm -hmm. basketball, that's right. a dream, right? Mom and dad, I don't need to be a doctor, <laughs> right? You know, Jeremy Lin plays basketball. He's Asian, I'm Asian, I can do that. You know, just again, going back to representation matters. And I think that's one way how we can build and heal despite all the horrible hate that we receive. I still intrinsically believe in the goodness of people. I really do. And with our boys, you know, I teach them whatever happens, you judge that person, that person alone, not their community, not their ethnic community, that person alone, their actions, judge them by that and do not judge the rest of the, the community members by that. Right. Um, you know, and, and <clears throat> just teaching them that yes, the whole as a family, as a community is important, but mental health nowadays, Again, that's part of the scary time that we live in. Mental health is so important and it's okay. And I think we need to teach our children, the young people, that it's okay to take care of yourself first mm -hmm. because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. Right. And that's okay. Um, like this just reminded me of a story when our boys were four and five, we were watching Marley and me and we know what happens to Marley. And they're like, they looked at me and they're like, mom, is it okay to cry? 
in a party, which is shocked. I'm like, when did we ever tell you that as a boy, right. it wasn't okay to cry. Yeah. And I said, of course, cry. And then they just went, yeah. right? So sad. <laughs> and, you know, again, just being cognizant mm -hmm. because we weren't raised like that, mm -hmm. right? And like I said, that sweet spot between two cultures in the middle, teaching our boys that, you know, as a man, it's okay to be sensitive. It's okay to feel, it's okay to cry when you need to. And I think that if we, it's almost like we have to give permission for our men, for our young boys to do those things, you know, feel, to feel. And so um, as a mom, who's gonna be a mother-in-law someday, you know, I just want them to find good people regardless, you know, of where they come from, their walks of life. That's most important, like what I said, love is love is love, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's it. Yeah. It is why we do the things that we do. I'm getting all ideals and philosophical, but that's <laughs> really what it is. And so long as you find a partner that loves you, wants what's best for you, mm -hmm. That is good enough. Who cares about you? Who cares about your social, emotional well-being, your mental health? All of that is so important because if you don't have that, you can't bring anything to any relationship, yeah. any partnership. And you know, being together for 29 years, we've had to learn this. You know, um, our parents, his in-laws, right, lived with us, and you know, our father has passed away already. But our mom, who's 93, who lives with us. And she's still very ingrained in the traditional sense of women's role and men's role, right? <laughs> but now it's different. It's kind of hard for her to see that it's okay if he makes dinner. It's okay if I don't make dinner because I've been working all day too. You know, just things like it's a, in teaching. And even our boys see this. They're like, mom and dad, you guys are like so perfect and in sync. I think there's something wrong with that too. <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> no, you want a partner in yeah. almost every sense possible in life because there's all that stuff that's out right. there. And when you come home to, that should be your safe place. Um, so that's, that's what I feel as a mom, as a woman, as a Hmong woman, that's how, we can, that's how we can heal. And that's how we can make things right. And that's how we can, you know, hopefully make the future better for those that are coming after us. Steve, last question for you. Tell us, what are you up to now? What is your path forward? and how can folks support you? So I am running for county supervisor. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna let the 2020 election and the hate speech that was spilled all over Elk Grove stop me. I think it's now more critical than ever uh, to stand up and uh, be heard. It's more critical now than ever uh, to call out um, the hate for what it is. And that being the case, and you know, I've, I'm committed uh, to to running for county supervisor the election is going to be june the 7th uh, for the primary and you know hopefully if i am blessed with with the the, the help of uh, the the voters uh, i would be in position one or two and that would allow me to advance to november um, so that's my hope uh, and um, uh, how you can help if is if you live in within driving distance uh, i can always use uh, uh, precinct walkers where where we have a number of uh, activities this weekend, uh, Go TV uh, uh, activities. And so um, if you're able to, I don't know when this is gonna air, but if, um, if it airs um, uh, before the weekend's over, please come out. Uh, I'm always looking for, uh, for help. Um, if you are able to um, uh, make a donation to support the campaign, you can on the website and that's supervisor Steve Lee, Lee is spelled L-Y dot com. And you can go on and, and make a donation and kind of follow me as to what I'm up to. And, and you can get a better idea of what my policy uh, uh, positions are, uh, particularly with education, public safety, uh, homelessness, mental health, uh, and uh, jobs and economic development. So those are the four pillars that I'm running on. And uh, I, I hope for the best and I hope that um, um, you know, those that have heard my message, uh, please continue to, to be an advocate for me to talk about what I've experienced. And, um, you know, this is not isolated to just us. Um, human beings will look for opportunities to, uh, to hurt other uh, individuals. And when that happens, we as a community, we need to stand up to it. Uh, and um, that's why I think it's so, so critical for this message to go out there.
to your viewers. Thank you so much for joining me for this special program. APA Heritage Month should exist every month, but for every day of our lives, let's be mindful of one another. If you'd like to check out more programs and all of our past podcasts or videos, you can head to commonwealthclub.org. For future events coming up, head to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS.